when Kaya told us about your theme for this year, about hometowns, I was just delighted because uh, I grew up here in the Quad Cities. Um, my parents were Augustana alums. Uh, I went to Red Shoes Preschool and then um, did my education in the Bendorf schools before it was time for me to choose a college. By the time I was 17, like a lot of 17 year olds, I was pretty sick of my hometown. <laughs> there's no art scene here, there's no literary culture, nothing ever happens right, in the Quad Cities. It wasn't until um, I returned to the Quad Cities after grad school, I was writing my dissertation, that I got my first clue that I might have been mistaken. Um, I had been reading this uh, really amazing one act play called Trifles. Um, and I flipped to the head note and read that the author, Susan Glasgow, was born in 1876 in Davenport. I thought, that's cool. And I started wondering, um, you know, who was the Susan Glasgow and had anybody else come out of my hometown? The, the book project that we're here to share with you today um, is the result of a group of Augustana English majors wondering together about the literary history of the Quad Cities. We wanted to know more about Susan Glasgow. What did she accomplish? We wanted to know more about Davenport in the early 20th century. Um, how did she class his work? We wanted to know if there have been others. Was she just an anomaly, or were there other talents that we could find ourselves in? What we discovered astonished us. Um, to be honest with you, I was expecting to find maybe one or two writers from the Quad Cities of minor literary significance. I was never expecting to find what we discovered, which was a large, a wide-ranging body of literature produced by some of the most important literary figures of their time. The writing um, that we discovered is forthcoming in our book, The Stories They Tell, which is an anthology of Quad Cities writing from the late 19th century and early 20th century. My job today is to give you a brief overview of some of the writers that are in this book, and then I'll turn it over to our experts, people that did the research on each of these writers, and I'll let them tell you why does they fell in love with these writers and why these writers might be worth your time. So I'm going to start um, with our most famous writer from the Quad Cities, Susan Glasgow. <coughs> Glasgow grew up, grew up in Davenport. Um, her house uh, is no longer there. It stood on East 12th Street, um, just on the west side of the village of East Davenport. She got her start as a journalist. Um, she first here in the Quad Cities, she wrote for the Weekly Standard. And she wrote a society column in which she went up from Davenport's upper class. Uh, and then she went on to, to Drake University, got a job as a reporter in Des Moines, where she was assigned to cover their um, legislature and their murder cases. In her 20s, she moved back to um, Davenport. Um, uh, and then shortly after that, moved on to Chicago and New York. Um, she, there in New York, she became a key participant in the um, Greenwich Village scene, where she was friends with Margaret Sanger and John Reed, um, and the St. Vincent of Millet. And she wrote a number of books during this time. Um, incredibly popular, incredibly well-reviewed. Um, the New York Times said that she, they put her among the, the rank, the high among the ranks of American storytellers. They called her work a big and real contribution to American novels. She had an impressive career in fiction, and yet it's not her career in fiction for which she's the best known, it's what she did in drama. In 1916, um, Glassfell and her husband, George Crabbe Cook, who was also from Davenport and was a writer, um, went to Provincetown, Massachusetts, where they started the Provincetown Players um, on the fishing wharf in Cape Cod. At a time when Broadway was dominated by melodrama, Cook and Glassfell, along with um, their collaborator, Eugene O'Neill, decided they wanted a different type of drama. They wanted something that, would, um, that was more artistic and which reflected contemporary American issues. One of the plays that she wrote um, for the Provincetown Players, Trifles, uh, which is about an American, or rather an Iowa farmer, um, who kills her husband, abusive husband. Um, well, this play is often cited as one of the greatest works in American theater. And that you'll see the scene from Trifles above. When she died in 1948, um, most of Glasgow's writing was out of print. And if she was mentioned at all, it was merely as an aside as someone that had helped Eugene O'Neill, who was the more famous <coughs> person that um, establish himself. In the 70s, though, uh, feminist critics got interested in her work. Um, today, there are, she's the subject of nine different books, two bi biographies, seven critical interpretations. There's a Susan Glasgow Society. Um, and today, she's widely recognized as a pioneering feminist writer and America's first important modern female playwright. Susan Glasgow wasn't the first major writer to come from Davenport. A generation prior, in the 1880s, Alice French, who spent her entire life in Davenport, was one of the most popular writers in America. 
She wrote under the pen name Octave Finney, um, and she was a prolific writer who published some 16 books and more than 50 short stories. Her writing is sometimes called regionalist or an example of local color writing, and so you might think of um, Mark Twain right, with his interest in local dialects and local customs. In the 1880s, Alice French was one of the highest paid authors in America. Um, she wrote about social issues over time, including labor and business practices, social responsibility, personal relationships, and religious issues. One of her most acclaimed works is called Man of the Hour, and it attacked the movement towards organized labor. Her most recognized anthology, Stories of a Western Town, was set in a fictionalized Davenport, um, and it's said that it was one of Theodore Roosevelt's favorite books. Today, there's been uh, a lot of critical attention given to her friends, fellow regionalists Mary, uh, Mary Wilkins Freeman and Sarah Orne Jewett. In fact, these two writers often appear in our um, American literature anthologies. French was friends with these women. She was right alongside them in her day. But French has yet to come um, under the sort of, um, been part of a recovery movement in the same way these, these two other writers have. We think it's time for that to change. Another Davenport resident, Arthur Davison Thick, Thicke, rather, um, made important contributions to poetry. Like French, Thicke came from a wealthy Davenport family. Um, their homes were bigger, nicer, better built, and as a result, they haven't been torn down in the way that some of the other writers have been. And you might recognize this house. It's on right a main drag over by Palmer College. So who was Thicke? Right? Well, he was a, a major poet uh, in the early 20th century. He was a frequent contributor to Harriet Monroe's Poetry Magazine, which was one of the premier poetry magazines during the modern period. Um, he published 16 books of poetry. Uh, many of these had multiple, came out in multiple editions. Uh, but what he's infamous for is his role in the Spectra hoax. The early 20th century was an interesting time in uh, American poetry. There are all these new movements coming out. There's imagism, vorticism, futurism. And there are all these writers that are experimenting with more compressed um, images and the economy of language. Vicky's tastes were much more traditional. Uh, and in 1916, he and a friend, uh, Litter Finer, Litter Finer uh, they got together and decided to come up with their own fake poetry movement, which they called the Spectrus. And they had a manifesto and all these sort of um, faux modernist poems. Literary critics thought it was the real thing. And so this goes down in history as one of the most famous literary hoaxes, and it happened in Davenport. <laughs> Another writer that I think everyone should know about is Floyd Dell. Um, this is a guy that half the girls in our class ended up having a crush on him by the end of the term. Uh, he, he, unlike Jackie in French, uh, Dell grew up poor. His house was right near the Bucktown area in Davenport, um, which at the time was the Red Light District, so he was just blocks away from, from brothels. Uh, he was a socialist from the age of 14. He dropped out of high school at 17, got a job writing for a, a local socialist newspaper called the Tri-Cities Worker. In the 20s, he left Davenport for Chicago, where he edited the Saturday Evening Post literary supplement and became a leading figure in the Chicago Renaissance, championing leftist writers like Carl Sandburg and Theodore Dreiser. Later, he would move to Greenwich Village, um, where he'd become a public intellectual uh, writing about child rearing, feminism, Upton Sinclair, sex, and where he was at the forefront of the American left. Uh, he was the managing editor and literary editor of the uh, leading leftist journal socialist magazine, The Maxis. He was also a prolific fiction writer on his own. Um, he published numerous novels, many about the changing sexual and social mores of Greenwich Village in the 1920s, um, and was widely regarded by his contemporaries as being at the forefront of American modernism. Not long ago, I was flipping through an uh, anthology of American literature published in 1930, and there I found Floyd Dell. He was sandwiched right between um, an excerpt from F. Scott Fitzgerald and Ernest Hemingway, and I think that speaks to the status that he had in his own day. One art scholar, Linda Bensby, put it, Today, Floyd Dell is considered by critics to be a minor writer and is virtually unknown to the general reading public. But during the first decades of the century, it was impossible to read news national newspapers, literary magazines or book reviews without coming across his name. If anyone could be said to be an early chronicler of modernism in America and of the great migration of writers and artists from the Midwest to Greenwich Village, it was Floyd Dell. Our research um, also turned up some surprises. 
LeClaire's William Buffalo Bill Cody, for example, enjoyed international fame with his touring Wild West show and posthumous autobiography, which helped popularize the romantic vision of the American West. During the Great Depression, Davenport's Cornelia Meigs wrote best-selling and Newbery Award-winning children's books that offered children strategies for negotiating the era's economic hardships and racial divides. In the 1940s and 1950s, uh, Rock Island's Charlotte Murray Russell wrote best-selling Jane Amanda Edwards mysteries that radically defied the traditional gender roles of the post-war years. And more surprising yet, were the letters we discovered from the Dakota Indians imprisoned at Fort McClellan, which is the present-day Lindsay Park over in Davenport. These were letters written in 1862, but only recently translated into English. And these letters reveal a long overlooked side of Tri-Cities life and witness how people facing genocide use writing to maintain and negotiate their changing cultural identity. So all of which is to say that the Quad Cities has a much richer literary history than my 17-year-old self who thought nothing good ever happened here could have imagined. But I want to now turn the floor over to um, the real experts, the students that researched each of these writers for their senior projects, so that you can hear more about the contributions of these Quad City writers made to American literature. Um, first up, let me introduce you to Malcolm Simon. You want to come up, Malcolm? Uh, Malcolm is one of the most resourceful researchers I've ever met. As part of his research in Vicki, he contacted um, their, his relatives and, and learned a lot about um, Vicki's private life. And also as part of that research, discovered that um, her great-grandfather um, had actually been part of the Contemporary Club, which Vicki had been a part of as well. So let me introduce you to Malcolm, and you'll hear about um, what he's learned about Vicki. Thank you very much all for coming today. Um, my intention was uh, to tell you a little bit about our Davis and Vicky. I haven't uh, spent some time uh, looking into Mammoth's work. Um, the, uh, I also think that, that Dr. Gillette did a wonderful uh, uh, job presenting uh, an overview of his, uh, of his achievements. Uh, however, um, my intention is to force some of his poetry on you today. <laughs> I'm going to do it. So, before we get to that, um, I think a lot has been made of the, uh, the Spectre hoax as being uh, a form of poetry that was not entirely sincere, in the sense that, you know, that, you know, here they are, they're trying to trick the literary establishment. And to some degree, that's correct. Um, but one of the things that I, I discovered in my research was that uh, as time went by, I think that both of them realized that although the, uh, the success of, you know, the spectacle of Spectre uh, tended to kind of uh, uh, Eclipse their own serious work on their own terms. Um, I think that they really uh, they realized over time that Vicky was quoted as saying that you know he honestly felt that some of his best work was in Spectre, uh, despite an admission for a guy who you know by all uh, appearances seemed to hold the new schools in uh, a bit of contempt. <laughs> so. Um, I've got a quote here from Vicky that, uh, that came in later. Uh, he was talking about how the fact that the two men, they composed all these poems in Moline, uh, the Spectre of Poems, and uh, all of them were composed in a, in a hotel room while they were uh, drinking scotch. <laughs> and uh, Vicky kind of hinted later that uh, they might have been on the verge of creating serious art uh, when they had to stop due to the dinner's train schedule. He said, it was only Gunner's opportune departure that prevented us from becoming seriously interested in further and genuine experiments and thus perishing at the hands of the monster which we had created. And that, that's, that's, uh, that's pretty telling. You know? um, in a sense, I feel almost as though they have created a new form of poetry, uh, synthesizing the, uh, the classic romantic uh, poetry of you know, their predecessors like uh, uh, Shelley and uh, Tennyson. But also, um, you know, although they, they definitely did not think that the just were doing anything wonderful uh, for uh, poetry, they had their own reasons for thinking so. It wasn't just an issue that, you know, well, they didn't like the new stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, some of the stuff I saw, especially uh, some of the uh, without mentioning any names, some of the local writers that wrote about the Spectre hoax, they, uh, they tended to see Vicky as the sort of curmudgeonly, uh, yeah, they, basically, uh, to make it short, they really didn't think of him as being, uh, you know, very uh, 
hospitable towards the new forms. Um, but uh, he even himself, I've got some quotes here where he's paraphrasing Kurtz up, but we might want to skip that. Um, he says, there are cases in which life strikes the emotion of the poet in broken flashes, and to record these, free verse is an unsurpassed medium. It is only with those who proclaim free verse to be the sole possible poetic medium that one has a right to quarrel. Because the carpenter finds the hatchet useful for certain kinds of work is hardly a reason for throwing the saw out of the window. Though Milton used free verse when he chose, he adapted the medium to his purpose. The new poets have made no mistake in using free verse. Their only error has been in committing themselves to it with too blind an exclusiveness. I'm going to go ahead and read you a couple of these Spectre poems. Um, this book here, uh, this is a William J. Smith's 1962 work, uh, The Spectre Books. I consider this to be the definitive work on the subject. The problem with this book is it's very difficult to get a hold of. The only uh, copy of the uh, library system I've been able to find that you can actually check out and read is located over at the St. Ambrose Library. Um, although there, are, there is also a copy of this book in the uh, special collections at the Davenport Public Library. Um, <coughs> This one is called Opus 40. <clears throat> I have not written, reader, that you may read. They sit in rows in the bare schoolroom, reading. Throwing rocks at windows is better, and over the tortoiseshell cat with the can tied on. I would rather be a can tire than a writer for readers. <laughs> I have written, reader, for abstruse reasons. Gold in the mine, blank water seeping into tunnels, a plank breaks and the roof falls. Three men suffocated. The wife of one now works in the laundry. The wife of another has married a fat man. I forget about the third. <laughs> so you can see what's going on here. Uh, Peggy is sort of like putting the, uh, the, what he saw I think is sort of the trivial nature of uh, some of the free verse poets that were writing in this time period. Um, I want to read you one more, and uh, then I'm going to turn it over here to my colleague, Ms. Whitaker. Um, but uh, I think you'll like this one. Listen, my friend, that you may understand me. In my earliest youth, I dreamed in Hughes Volcanic. I saw each day open like a curtain of flame. Black slaves attended my waking moments. Three ebony slaves wash sleep from my white body. Three ebony slaves around my ivory smoothness folded heavy robes of crimson and white. And as I issued forth into the blue vault of the daylight, a gray ape pranced before me and a leopard crept behind. This was the state of my young heritage. Scarlet as the voice of trumpets was the pageant of my days. Can I accept now the twilight and soon the dark where all colors die. Before I die, I will hold one last revel. I will have golden cups and poppy curtains. And yet, no! In a black hall, the black table shall spread far down before me, and all the feasters garbed in black. Then, at the feast height, I, rising, shall with a gesture like the midnight, throw back my midnight robe and suddenly stand naked, the sole white flame of the world. <laughs> Personally, I thought that one was hilarious. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. Next up, we'll hear from Megan Bodiger. She is an English neuroscience Spanish major. Um, she used to be the editor in chief of Augustana's newspaper, The Observer. So, most people know Floyd Dell and Susan Glasgow for their work in fiction, and <coughs> but Megan became really interested in their early newspaper writing. And so, she's going to talk to you today about what she's discovered as part of that. <laughs> Uh, I'm so short, I can't even see everybody <laughs> right here. <laughs> um, but uh, as she said, I was the editor-in-chief of the RCN Observer for a year, a position I very much enjoyed. And so um, that was my position as, you know what, I'm just <laughs> I like this better. Um, so uh, I enjoyed that position, and that's what I was in uh, while I was doing this research. And uh, as I was looking into Floyd Dell and Susan Glasspool, 
um, I found that they have a rich um, journalistic history that's actually often ignored um, in a lot of anthologies and literary criticism about them, and so that's what I looked into. Um, and also, I spent um, a lot of time creating some well-orchestrated thoughts about my research, so I have no qualms reading verbatim what I've created. Um, so that's what I'm going to start with. Um, I come from a Midwestern city named Peoria. Peoria is often referred to as the most average city in the United States. Uh, does it play in Peoria used to be a popular question to gauge whether production would be well received by the rest of America as a whole. Uh, in fact, much of the American Midwest is considered average. Being from here, I'm sure you guys understand. Um, however, the Midwest is composed of much more than flyover states made up of white middle working class of populations, traditional family values, and corn. Um, contrary to popular belief, the history of the Midwest is a kaleidoscope of extremes, making the region average not through lack of diversity, um, but through the balancing act of said diversity. Um, one of the most diverse times in the history of the United States as a whole is the early 1900s. This was an era characterized by the rise of industry and the distribution of information as technology enabled the mass production of goods and publications um, by hysteria and patriotism, patriotism and changing ideas. Um, these were exciting times, and the Midwestern Tri-City area on the border of Illinois and Iowa was an exciting place. One of the Tri-Cities, Davenport, uh, is where journalists Floyd Dell and Susan Glassville resided for a while, uh, as um, Meg Gillette brought up earlier. Um, and they ran in the same circles as other movers and shakers of the time. Uh, the fact of it is, river towns like Davenport and Peoria were actually breeding grounds for some pretty interesting characters. Uh, the river town of Davenport beat with the heart of the Midwest at the turn of the century when Dell and Glassville lived and breathed its factory polluted air especially in Davenport. Um, there was such a mix of people and ideas at the turn of the century that one couldn't help but be bombarded by viewpoints and experiences different from one's own. Uh, there's an open trade not only of industry but also of information. And this Epicurean atmosphere impacted Dells and Glassbell's experiences and hence their writing. Um, their works of fiction have been recovered in the last few decades, um, but they're, uh, they're yellowing that they um, are often described as using in their writing um, that marked jazz age journalism, um, a phenomenon that created journalism too real for the literary canon and too passionate for history textbooks. Um, and that was a tag used to dismiss and repress the ideas, um, and it forces America to face the diversity in its heartland, um, and instead the diversity is averaged and insignificant. Um, so I think it's important um, to understand kind of where. Uh, Floyd Dell and Susan Glassville came to understand how it influenced their writings, particularly their journalism, because um, as a journalist, you write generally about your locale. Um, Floyd Dell was born in small town America, specifically small town Midwest America, in Barry, Illinois. Uh, as the youngest in the family and a golden locked, intelligent boy, Floyd earned a warm place in his mother's heart. Being the darling he was, his mother and father shielded him from the fact that the family had little money, teaching him what was respectable while struggling to make Christmas a real holiday for Floyd. Um, the family went to Quincy, Illinois, in search of work, and then finally to Davenport, um, where he spent his last years of high school, and then he dropped out before his final year. Um, coming as he did from a low-income family, Floyd assumed at the start that he must be fated to work in a factory. Uh, he did indeed cycle through a few factory jobs in his early life, but it dawned on him one day that his propensity for writing would lead him to a career in publishing. From then on, he was hired on and fired from various newspapers, <coughs> magazines, and literary reviews in Davenport. <coughs> rubbing elbows with some of the greatest artists of the time and region, especially George Graham Cook. These acquaintances further bred in Floyd's intense intellectual bent and opened his eyes to a variety of art forms and ideas. Um, after being fired from yet another Davenport publication, Floyd left for Chicago, um, nursing his socialist ideal, ideals, poetry, and lack of any real love life. Uh, he worked for the Evening Post Literary Review, becoming the sole editor for a while. From there, he migrated to New York New York with the Greenwich Village crowd, uh, enjoying a period of bohemia and free exchange of intellectualism while he worked for the masses, um, as Meg brought up earlier. Um, after the masses, after Greenwich Village, after the war, he began writing his novels. And though he eventually fell into relative obscurity, he didn't stop writing until the end of his life in 1969. Um, likewise, Susan Glassfell was raised in Davenport graduating from Davenport High School in 1894, and then reporting for the Davenport Morning Republican for two years. Um, she studied at Drake University. She began reporting for the Des Moines Daily News. Um, she covered what was called the Hassock Trial. Um, so during her um, time you know, reporting on murders, um, she covered this, and that is often considered the basis for trifles um, after she covered it. And in our anthology, I include um, a lot of her, not just trifles, but her actual reports that she based 
um, that off of, um, which was a long-running trial, obviously, as you know, an axe murder might be. So. <laughs> Um, there's quite a bit of information on that, and you can see through there kind of the yellowing quality um, that many people ascribe to that, kind of a sensationalist, um, emotional view to it. Um, and so she did um, that for a while, and then she came back to Davenport, brushed shoulders um, with the ladies of the Tuesday Club and the Monas Society, um, and that's when she met George Graham Cook, um, and she eventually married him. At the time, though, he was engaged. Um, so there's kind of a questionable situation going on for a little while. Um, and kind of to avoid that situation, she left the Quad Cities um, and focused on her writing. Um, and she came back after his marriage was over. Um, and so, you know, the affair started up again. She published The Visioning in 1911. Um, he divorced uh, his second wife, um, and they were married. So. Um, that kind of began her time with the Provincetown players where, you know, she created a lot of the literature that's now widely critiqued and widely regarded as well. Um, and so she was kind of a long way from her days with the Morning Republican. Um, they were, you know, creative days, playful days. Um, Cook died in 1924, um, that's when she quit the players and then really went into her writing and eventually came back to Davenport. <laughs> Um, neither Dell nor Glasswell escaped the social and liberal heaviness of the time or the extremes of Midwestern life, which gave their writing diversity, social commentary, and credibility, even as their writing engaged tactics of yellow journalism. Um, yellow journalism, as I said, is the phenomenon of reporting based on sensationalism, a rash of exciting and shocking stories that sacrifice accuracy um, to inspire public interest. And so there's some exaggeration going on, um, which, you know, as the editor of a paper, I can tell you, you keep that out of your writing if you want to be regarded um, in any professional sense. Um, both Glasswell's and Dell's writings picked up on some yellow and sensational, sensationalist qualities, and they did so because they had something to say. They didn't want um, just to reflect events as they were. They wanted to reflect events you know, more as they could be, trying to teach what you can get out of um, events that were happening. Um, as Joseph Campbell writes in a book about the phenomenon, he says, Moreover, yellow journalism was exciting journalism. Its crusades against privilege and powerful interests were widely admired. Its exposure of corruption in municipal government probably encouraged the rise of magazine muckraking in the early 20th century. Um, Dell and Glasswell played a role in these yellow campaigns to an extent. Um, a deeply informed and diverse worldview is part of what uh, bent Dell's and Glasswell's writings towards yellow journalism. And their Midwest upbringing had a strong hand in giving them those views. Uh, the Middle West must have taken a strong hold of me in my early years, for I've never ceased trying to figure out why it is as it is, wrote Glasswell in a 1945 letter. Um, and she often tries to express the conflicting personalities of the region, um, the seemingly compulsory moral attitudes and repression against the free-thinking ways and liberalism um, that those same attitudes invariably sponsor. Dell found a similar dichotomy in Midwestern values. Um, in the first decade of the 1900s, he began writing for the Tri-City Workers magazine, uh, where he wrote in the main their CDs for the majority of his pieces. Um, interestingly, I um, looked up uh, where he would have gotten Thersides from, um, and it's from Homer's Iliad. Um, he's described, Thersides is described as the ugliest man to enter Troy, and one who says what everyone is thinking, um, although no one is going to say it. So he says what's on everyone's mind, and then he gets beat for it, but he says it anyway. Um, and he's used, it, um, he's used later by like Hegel and Marx um, as a social critic, a dissenter, um, and that is, that's the name that uh, Dell took on in these Tri-City Workers Magazine pieces. Um, an example of, art, of his articles from this publication is one titled The Salvation of the Working Class. Um, and so an excerpt from this, just a small uh, quote. Um, and who is it that does care? The socialists. Not that socialists are especially good men, but did you ever see a true socialist who could laugh at the spectacle of a fallen woman? He cannot. He knows that she is an unfortunate member of his own class, and that such a fate is not altogether impossible in the course of events for his own near and dear ones. He does care. Who cares the class conscious working man cares? When you find class conscious working men, you find better morals. The two go hand in hand. Um, so that's the viewpoint that he's coming out of with his writings. Uh, and having lived just up the street from Davenport's red light district, uh, she brought up earlier, he would have been impacted by the comings and goings of those blocks. Uh, in the same magazine, he wrote a feature called White People Go to Brickman Rose, um, Brickman, Brickman Rose being um, a rather large entertainment house, uh, a bar. Um, and so he calls it a dancing pavilion with a saloon in the front and the whole red light district behind it. Um, and that exists because the working class doesn't ask for justice, it asks for happiness, according to Dell. 
Um, and this imbalance of justice and entertainment between the working and higher classes is the problem, according to him. Um, that's the problem with the capitalist system, um, bringing him to his socialist views. Uh, and these articles incorporate his personal experience both with the red light district and the working class and those experiences given him um, by the chance to study the business and professional classes as well. His first-hand experiences and modern perceptions led to a strong call to action in most of his journalistic exploits. Um, Glasgow was similarly attentive to the social implications. Um, so as she's covering the Hasek case, um, the, main the main murder suspect was the wife of the farmer, which is where we get trifles if you haven't read it before, I do highly recommend it. Um, and so she was the um, she was the main subject, um, leading to a series of trials and presentations of evidence. Um, she documents Glasswell documents all of it. Um, the investigation found basically that the marriage was an unhappy one, a fact that combined with Mrs. Hosick's lacking defense led the jury to find her guilty of murdering her husband with an axe in the middle of the night. As a woman reporting on a woman's indictment, Glasswell was hung up on the motives a woman might have to murder her husband, as you might. Why would someone murder their husband with an axe in the middle of the night? <laughs> Uh, years after the incident, incident, she wrote Trifles um, and then adapted it later as well into a jury of her peers, which is a short story as opposed to a play. Um, so she's clearly hung up on it through her entire career, um, you know, from the start when she was a reporter to when she was a playwright to when she wrote um, longer works of fiction. Um, and I believe they're intended not just to explore the gender discrepancy driven motives, um, but also to question the justice system. How justified is it to sentence Mrs. Hosick to death for committing a murder motivated by unjust treatment? Um, you know, perhaps she had put in uh, calls before about this or, you know, tried to get more help from that. Um, so I believe that there's also a questioning of that justice system. Um, something that you don't always um, find in her fiction works, um, but you can see through her sensationalist journalism. Um, and just as Dell hung his hat on the discrepancy between working and professional class justice, Glasswell's reports delve into the discrepancy between justice for men and women. Um, so we do see editorializing, I'll give you an example, she says in one of them. Um, Slowly but surely, the prosecution in the, Ho the, prosecution in the Hossack murder case is weaving a web of circumstantial evidence around the defendant that will be hard to counteract. The examination of each additional witness leaves a perceptible effect on the jury, and their faces become more and more set and stern. Mrs. Hasek is bearing up well under her trying ordeal, but day by day her countenance becomes more haggard and drawn. She may come out of the trial a victor, but the terrible strain cannot but have an effect of permanently undermining her health and bringing her to an early grave. To many it seems her hair is turning perceptibly lighter, and the gray is gradually giving way to silver. So you can see that you would not read something like that um, anywhere but maybe an opinion section in magazines these days. Um, this kind of colorful reporting is considered yellow journalism, um, and in these reports, she creates a more dynamic view of the trial, giving a strong voice to the defense in her articles. Um, so another one from, you know, Senator Berry's defense speech. Um, At times, the jury, without the exception, was moved to tears. Strong men who had not shed a tear in years sat in their seats, mopping their eyes and compressing their lips in a vain effort to suppress the emotion caused by the senator's eloquent plea. She has no idea if they cried in tears. Um, it is unlikely that Glasswell actually saw each member of the jury shed a tear or knew that the strong men in the room had not cried. Um, and a scholar of hers, um, Linda Benzvi, says um, that the articles make ready use of hyperbole, invention, and supposition, all filtered through one of Glasswell's common devices in her column, a lively, often opinionated persona. Um, however, these tropes are necessary in counteracting the assumptions about women that the prosecution uses. Glasswell wrote yellow in reaction to the court's discredit of Mrs. Hosick by bringing up domestic disputes. And in her finale, uh, her pregnancy out of wedlock was also part of the case. Um, Mr. Hosick's seeming mistreatment of his wife, however, is excused. Glasswell works on the conscience of her audience with her emotional descriptions in order to balance the scale between the justice system and traditional women's sphere. In this way, Glasswell matches Dell for subversive commentary in a forum that required a little bit more subtlety. Um, and this call to action journalistic writing is generally frowned upon um, as the Espionage and Sedition Acts were enacted in 1917 and 1918. It also became increasingly dangerous, landing some writers in jail. Um, and another expert, another excerpt Bell's writing for The Liberator um, after the masses was shut down. Um, his article is entitled, What Are You Doing Out There? Um, and it refers directly to a quote um, by Thoreau to Emerson. When Emerson asked Thoreau, you know, visiting him in jail, what are you doing in there when you visited Thoreau in jail? Um, and it's one of the clearest calls to action from Dell, though his whole career is riddled with socialist and liberal pieces. Um, Dell answers the question the best he can. 
Um, and the only self-respecting answer we can give to them uh, is this grim, silent challenge. We are working to get you out, you know? Um, the answer to throws what are you uh, doing in there is, uh, is, well, what are you doing out there? Uh, you know, he says to him, I'm in here for a reason, what are you doing out there? And um, Dell says, well, we're working to get you out. That should be our answer. Um, so he's highlighting the plight of conscientious objectors um, and the injustice that the Espionage Act is doing to the public as a whole. Um, he says, uh, precisely because they are socialist pacifists, IWWs, there's, um, there will be powerful influences at work to keep them right where they are. And if these elements have their way, they will rot there, Dell writes. Um, the list of offenders goes on and on. He inquires where the madness ends. Uh, you know, and so that's um, an, under, an underpinning theme of a lot of his um, journalistic writing that, again, you don't um, see quite as clearly in his fiction writing, which receives much more attention. Um, in the same way, whistleblowers are hushed up. Dell's, Glassfells, and other journalistic exploits were deemed yellow and so discredited. Because um, if their ideas are credible, then you have to address them. Um, this is the same reasoning behind why, public, why the public at large tries its damnedest to consider the Midwest boring. Because it already accepts that this region and what comes out of it are average America. There's a strong piece of the population, both then and now, that would find both Dell's socialist outcry and the Midwestern diversity that it bred uncomfortable. Um, yellow journalism is a convenient tool for this discrediting process, because a good portion of articles with these yellow qualities were in fact unreliable, However, the wheat can still be separated from the shaft. Uh, there's a difference between objectivity and truth. Some, journal some journalism is much more similar to fantasy than others. Even conservative publications like the Washington Post ran reports of sea servants. And I argue that stories of this kind certainly can't be held on the same plane as critiques of the American society and government. What incriminates articles like Dells and Glassbells are their lack of objectivity in reporting true events and issues. Dell and Glasswell put themselves and their opinions into articles that were entering an already skewed dialogue. Um, David Mindage frames the problem um, in a book he writes, Just the Facts, How Objectivity Came to Define American Journalism. Um, as I said, that's a huge basis for journalism nowadays, that everything is objective, that you leave your opinions out of it. Uh, he says, the practice of objectivity has also come under scrutiny from those who point out correctly that it too often reflects a world dominated by white men, that it too often serves the status quo. As Dell pointed out in The Liberator, there were plenty of citizens across the country that were quieted for what they wrote. Midwestern writers are particularly easy to ignore going forward because few people look for a radical revolution out of the Midwest, and few want one. I didn't hear about Floyd Dell and Susan Glassbell in my middle or high school classes. Um, they were written out of our canon because they don't fit the, of, the profile of Midwesterners. Um, they aren't boring, they don't serve the status quo, and their articles address real issues. The articles written by Dell and Glasgow are too yellow to have a place in a journalistic canon that phrases object objectivity, but they're too objective to have a state in a literary canon that phrases creativity. Many other reformers of the modernist era of the modernist era took to writing fiction, um, you know, such as Upton Sinclair or Willa Cather, and we do hear about them. Um, but objective journalism simply doesn't grab attention the way fictive narrative can. Midwestern journalistic writers don't fit the literary box constructed for them, and journalism doesn't fit in the box constructed for literature in our educational system. Um, Underwood states, uh, by the 1920s, the notion of a deep divide between high and popular culture had become entrenched which much, <coughs> with much of the literary intelligentsia. Um, another writer uh, chalks up the marginalization of journalism and elitism and hegemony um, in the literary academy. Um, to other issues, saying, uh, as it is, our literary critics are a cheerless lot. Um, either in this devalued world, they are still groping for order, or they have an axe to grind that is sociological or journalese rather than literacy. Um, and this appears to hold true today. Literism, uh, sorry, journalism at large is barely included in any curriculum at any level at all. Uh, one might be hard pressed to name more than one or two famous journalists. Uh, if you go ask a middle schooler or a high schooler, I bet you know the chances even go down. Um, we just keep that out of our canon. And in leaving out socially minded yellow journalism, there's a hole in those canons. Neither Floyd Dell nor Susan Glassbell received much review of the journalistic ep uh, efforts in the early 1900s. Dell's The Masses was shut down for dissemination of information. And that's about as much of a public reflection of his journalism um, and liberal viewpoints as he ever received at the time. Floyd Dell mostly lacked substantial criticism until the 1960s, um, when George Thomas Tanzel began dissertations and articles about his work. 
Um, and prior to that, uh, there's really just not much. Um, when you look through modern databases. Um, he's often referred to and talked about in the context of socialism or his Midwesternness. Um, and many of the titles of those kinds of articles contain the word radical. Um, even in dealing with feminism or sex in his novels, they really fall back on the leftist nature of his writing. But even so, there's, merely, there's barely more than two pages of articles, and none of them relate specifically to his journalism. Even though his life consisted of moving between different newspapers and magazines, and his journalism addressed all of these topics directly. Uh, similarly, Susan Glasgow received very little attention until the 1970s, and then her plays received a lot of treatment. Um, but just, you know, her plays, her fiction. Um, there's quite a lot of criticism of her literature in recent years. There's even um, a novel called The Night Assassin uh, about the Hasek murder trials. Um, and other than that, there's no mention of her journalistic writing. Her presentations at the Davenport Tuesday Club and her articles and magazines are left untreated. Uh, hence, in both authors' library of literary critiques, there's a piece missing, their journalism. The lack of journalistic review and critique is just another form of censorship and a continuation of the silencing that occurred at the onset of World War I. Though Dell himself is remembered as a radical or a rebel, his writings are not. Uh, they're not especially famous or well discussed, they're not often interpreted, and his articles, essays, and poetry have been swept under the rug for the most part. They make it into history only in biographies, never in literary criticism. Similarly, Glasgow's smart and poignant articles are not acknowledged today uh, due to the yellowness in her reporting and Midwesternness in her upbringing. Uh, besides demonstrating the censorship rampant in our culture, these Midwest authors also show much, how much sway the categoriz categorization of high literature has on our canon. These Midwesterners are still behind bars. Only their fiction has been exonerated. Their journalism, spoken for by neither scholars nor public interest, contains the heart of the unheard voices, the conscientious objectors, and any self-respecting scholar, artist, or so-called informed cynicism should hear them out. Uh, Dell and Glasgow were shaped by the waves of, of intellectual tides in a Midwestern river town in a way that proves the Midwest is average in a completely different way than many people realize. The Midwest is an average of cultures, races, races histories, styles, products, and ideas. This conglomeration of extremes lends itself to their expression. Like yellow articles or the Greek their CDs, um, the Midwest has always had a way of saying those things that everyone is thinking, but no one wants to voice. And like their CDs, the ugliness of the Midwest is what allows it to be discredited. And in that discredit, perfectly free to keep speaking, just ignored. However, it may be time to give ethos where ethos is due. Writings like these are asking us, what are you doing out there? And what answer can we give but this? We're working to get them out. <laughs> so as you can tell, we have a pretty rich literary history here in the Quad Cities. Um, I think a lot of us think of the Midwest and think of the Tri-Cities as being a rather homogenous, repressive, conservative place, but the Tri-Cities that emerged from the body of literature that we recovered was far more cosmopolitan, um, diverse, progressive than we'd ever imagined. Um, today we're honored to be bringing attention to this overlooked body of literature. Uh, I think we have a lot to be proud of in our, our literary history here in the Quad Cities. Um, and as this, this literature has inspired us, we hope it will inspire you as well. So thank you so much for having us. I, I don't know if you were aware that a few years ago there was a play put on the stage of the Spectra Hopes. Was there? It was a, a grant that the Midwest Writing Center received and PJ Elster wrote. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of have spectral readings every once a month. And I'm aware of that, but I didn't know they'd done a play. Oh, in fact, we participated in the play. Do you remember who else? No. Um, B.J. Elker. She wrote it. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, the connection with Witter Vimmer, when Rebecca Wee was awarded the Witter Vimmer Award, that started to bring some attention here to uh, who that person was and his uh, connection with the Quad Cities. Excellent. Yeah. What was your criteria for including or leaving writers out? Uh, so, um, students chose who they wanted to work on. Um, and so people gravitated towards the writers that, that spoke to them. Um, and that's really how the, the writers were chosen for our, our work. I think the one person that we left out that I wish we had um, had another student in our class to work on was um, George Cram Cook, who was a part of our anthology, but also was at Well, writer. also Harry Hansen. The Davenport journalist who then he ended up taking time in the Tribune, didn't he? Chicago Tribune. So they will have to look forward And Marjorie Ellen Seifert, the Moline poet. Yes, yeah, we looked at her as well. Right? Okay. Yeah. Did it turn did she didn't turn you on? Well I think I had one. <laughs> 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 yeah, we had a
smaller group to take on it. Yeah, maybe one or two, right? These can be. Yes. Charlotte Murray Russell, what was her era again? Um, she was wrote 1940s, 1950s, and I my memory is that she worked here actually. She, that's why she I got she got so ticked at Nikki Spillane she quit writing mysteries <laughs> and came to work as a cataloger of this library. <laughs> <laughs> well, she died in 1992. <coughs> I knew she was a librarian. <coughs> she was probably just. Oh, no. oh. 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 Has anyone ever studied her? Uh, one of our students um, worked on uh, her mysteries. Uh, they're, they were, they're delightful. They have um, these recipes that are interspersed with the mystery. They're just uh, wonderful. If you're looking for something to read, uh, check out, yeah, check her out. Thank you. Where can people get a copy of this book? This is, uh, we're expected to have it from the printers in the next couple of weeks. Oh, okay. um, and at that point, I'll be sending them to all the different local libraries so you'll be able to find it there. Um, we should have some copies in the, the bookstore at Augustana. Um, but if anybody's interested in, in Seeing a copy once done, if you want to leave me your contact information, I can make sure you know about it once it's out. But I'm expecting the next couple of weeks, and then it'll be in local library. Thank you so much for coming. I have one oh, question. Oh, yeah. And this is not with your literary um, people from the Midwest, but when you mentioned the Shawnees and their letters uh, at the time of the Civil War, tell me about, I didn't realize that they wrote. I thought everything was horrible up there. Um, there so some of them learned to write and, in their own language, and what was that? There was an anglicized, if I may, Thank there you. was an anglicized version of the Dakota language, not Shawnee, that was Dr. Warren from before. And in fact, an Augustana uh, professor named A.W. Williamson, uh, his father was a clergy person who translated the, uh, the Christian the scripture uh, into Dakota language, and there are copies of that in the Augustana Special Collections uh, that you can see. So there was a written form. If you can see, right underneath that, Dakota Kaskapi Okisize Wawapi is simply the translation of Dakota Prisoner of War Letters. So that's that's. But what was their script? It was it was an it was an it was our alphabet. Oh, it was they, our they, alphabet. They jammed so it into our alphabet. That. Yes. Yes, and it was it was uh, mostly Christian missionaries like the father of this A.W. Williamson who worked at, the, at Augustana. So like I said, you can go to the special collections and you can see um, certain books that were translated, I think. And Doc, you know, I think it's only the Dakota languages that they have in special collections. Are you familiar with I that? Think, I think so. Yeah. yeah, that those were just sort of rediscovered a few years ago. Right. I mean, the prisoners from here wrote letters back talking about what life was like here. Yes. And uh, so they are really interesting. So that's a book you can pick up right now. Right. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get permission from the translators to include those letters in our anthology. Um, but this book tells the story of how they learned um, to write these letters back and forth and then include those letters so you can read them. They're, they're heartbreaking. Um, I, I did have a, a quick question for the students, but before we get to that, um, if you don't mind Meg going to the cover again, uh, what I'm really grateful for is that Meg was looking for a local artist to provide the cover art, and so the director of the Augustine Art Museum at the time asked me, is there a local artist from the late 19th, early 20th century that we could include? And of course the initial answer, the immediate answer is Frank Lundell, and the college is very lucky to have quite a few Frank Lundells. In fact, my colleague, the general counsel of the college, uh, did I ever get you into her office? She's got like six <laughs> Lundells in her office. Right. Yeah, right, right. So I was, I thought that was a nice touch by Dr. Gillette to include also a local artist who was born and raised in Moline, uh, Lundell. But anyway, so like uh, Freud, not so well known, right, uh, and, and, and maybe Vicky, not so well known. But as you went into them, did you trip on other authors and writers that now you're interested in just from a personal level? From Maybe not from here, but... Um, not, not as much. A lot of our research was very much into their lives and their routines, um, just because those aren't as well known. Um, and they happened to, you know, brush shoulders with people who really are well known, and so it wasn't so much discovering people that hadn't already been discovered. Yeah. They were kind of the minorities there in terms of fame, so... At least from my end. Uh, the gentleman earlier mentioned uh, Marjorie Allen Seifert, and she uh, certainly showed up in my research. Um, I really didn't know that there was a, 
a sort of literary circle of writers in this area. And it seems that they all knew each other as well. You know, I, I stumbled across my own grandfather's uh, yeah. and during my research, and I was just blown away by that. Um, he was also an attorney. Uh, as Peggy was also an attorney. Um, although I don't think he was he was a practicing attorney. Um, well, in the sense that, you know, he was more of a, what they call a freeholders barrister. Um, but it was, it was very interesting uh, to me that there, there are so many, it seems like this, this area had quite a, a circle of writers. And I, I didn't, uh, I didn't think that we were, uh, that I was going to encounter anything like that when I started doing this research. I'd never heard of Peggy myself. Yeah. So. But now, as you know, the conversation continues even up to and beyond 3 o'clock, thanks to the library and our good friend Ted Grievous of Theo's. Uh, Supply some coffee and some treats that are right outside. Uh, but before we wrap up, I would remind you that the 17th Annual Freeze Lectures conclude next Tuesday with a lecture by Dave Rath, sort of tying everything back to the Hometown Teams exhibit that the Rock Island Public Library got from the Smithsonian, thanks to Lisa's leadership. We hope we'll see you next Tuesday at 2 p.m. But until then, we join me in thanking our presenting scholars. <coughs>